<clears throat> Hello, uh, we'll talk now about uh, an important uh, um, uh, Italian architect who actually works and lives in Barcelona, in Catalonia. Uh, and uh, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, contemplate her work. This is the website where you'll see works by, done by uh, Benedetta Taliabue, but the name of the firm is Miraes Taliabue because her husband, Eric Miraes, died, um, I don't know, almost 20 years ago, at the age, I think, of 45, a remarkable, a truly one of the best European and world architects when he was alive, but he died at 45 and his second wife, Benedetta Taliabue, uh, continued the works that she started together with Enig Miraes and uh, continues, uh, continues to this day a very rich, uh, creative and acknowledged uh, uh, professional practice. Uh, this is, um, this is uh, Benedetta Taliabue, uh, born in Italy, I think in Milan, and she was educated in Milan. But then she went uh, to work in Barcelona for uh, uh, Carme Pinos and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Eric Miraes. And uh, well, uh, uh, it happened, they fell in love, uh, Eric Miraes with her, and uh, so they got married. And uh, then he died at 45 of a brain tumor. Uh, but she is a, a very uh, interesting architect uh, who loves books, just as Enig Miraes loved books uh, a lot, actually. And there are plenty of books in her office. And her idea, and probably also the idea of Enig Miraes, was that uh, a good architecture practice, a good architectural office, is also an office where learning takes place. So it's not just about producing works, but it's also an educational center. It's where you learn new ideas, new things. You'd open a book. It's about culture. Architecture is a cultural phenomenon. Here she is on the bicycle, probably in, uh, in, in Barcelona. And uh, well, uh, so uh, images from her office which uh, has uh, some fantastic things in a way on the walls. Uh, the, what is on the walls uh, matches what is on her. Uh, and uh, it's an unusual uh, office because, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's also where they live, where she lives. And I think with her son, uh, I think now he's also part of the office. Let's start. Um, Let's start uh, looking at some of the buildings that uh, Benedetta Taliabue built. She uh, um, uh, won the competition for the Spanish pavilion at the uh, World Expo in Shanghai. I forgot, in maybe 2008 or something. Um, but I wrote there a kita, which is the, the Romanian word for the material she used for the Spanish pavilion. Look at this, China, Shanghai. Benedetta Taliabue. I admire very much this work. Uh, yes, it's true. Behind this oven, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, building uh, is a steel structure. This might be a little bit problematic, but I think Benedetta Taliabue wanted to weave her building. And if we look at the word architect from 19, from 1550s, from the middle French uh, word architect, which came from Latin architectus, from Greek, Greek architecton, master builder or director of works, from archi, which means archi or arch means chief. But then we have tecton, the other half of the word. So architecton. Tecton comes from texture. And um, texture in the early 15th century meant network or structure from Middle French texture or directly from Latin textura, web, texture, structure. From texere, which means to weave from the Proto-Indo-European root tex, T-E-K-S, which means to weave, to fabricate, to make, make weaker, Rakita or wetl, wetl framework. 
So the work, the all the actually, and I have a, I have an, a kind of a diagram, and I could send it to you, where it shows that all the words defining architecture, or uh, words uh, deriving from the word architecture, everything related linguistic, linguistically to the word uh, architecture, comes from text T E K S, which means to weave. So weaving is immensely important for architecture. And that's what we see here, some form of a weaving. Um, by the way of this, I want to say something else. Gottfried Semper in the 19th century had a great intuition that actually, I don't think he knew about the text and the, you know, the, the, the etymology of the word uh, uh, architecture or architect, but he thought that the first building ever built was done in this way. This was Godfrey Semper. I will explain in a few words a little bit later. A very important uh, German architect and theoretician who asked himself how did the first building ever built came into being. And he gave an, uh, an answer that was significant. In fact, uh, it was uh, almost... Uh, uh, you know, uh, completely opposite to the one given by Abel Ogier, a Frenchman who said that the first building was when the primitive man uh, built some columns and the beams and then the roof. But Godfrey Semper had a completely different idea. And here they, they are. He saw that the first building had four elements of architecture. The hearth, where the fire was, the roof, the enclosure and the mount. His idea was like this, that the first people who ever built a house, they were people without a house. They gathered around the fire. They had fire. They were coming from work, either fishermen or uh, hunters. So they gathered around the fire and they understood the importance of fire. They needed, they understood it has to be protected. It is vital to protect fire in order to, you know, to protect themselves, to live. But how to do it? Because they didn't have tools to cut down trees and build columns and beams. So they took vegetal materials from the bushes and the trees, and they started to weave them. And they created some uh, panels kind of similar to what uh, uh, Benedetta Taliabue Talia used for the Spanish pavilion in uh, Shanghai. And that's how they created the enclosure. Then they understood that they have to elevate the fire a little bit from the earth, and they created the mound, the platform on which, or sokul in Romanian, on which the house was built. And, and the, the hearth is, you know, where the fire was, the, you know, the hearth, vatra in Romanian. And at the end, they created the roof when they developed a little bit and they were able, able to do carpentry. So hearth, metallurgy and ceramics, because it's the, the fireplace. The roof, carpentry, enclosure, textile and weaving, mount, earthwork. These are the four elements that uh, Godfrey Semper thought created the first house ever built. And here they are again. The origins of each element can be found in the traditional crafts of ancient society. Hearth, fire, ceramics, roof, carpentry, enclosure, weaving. And it was his idea that it was actually the first thing to do to protect fire from the animals. And uh, they created these, uh, these panels with woven vegetal materials or material, the Carib Caribbean uh, hut, you know, in 1851, the great exhibition. And you see here the, the hearth, we see the, the woven uh, panels built with vegetal materials that was taken from bushes and trees. We see the mound and we see the roof, the four elements of the, of the primeval hut. But this was the conception of Abel Ogier, a uh, Frenchman, that the first house came into being by, uh, uh, you know, uh, using the trunk, uh, trunks of the trees 
uh, columns and then uh, create the beams and uh, then the roof and so on. In my opinion, this is the masculinist conception of the first house, while Gottfried Semper's is the feminist conception of the first house. But when we think that etymologically the word architect and architecture comes from text, T-E-K-S, which means to weave, maybe Godfrey Zemper is right. Now, I, this subject interested me and I reflected on it and I found out that all the gods and goddesses of uh, weaving were actually women. So they were goddesses, not gods. Ishtar in Mesopotamia a goddess, a goddess of love, even of war and of weaving. Lilith in, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for us, for uh, uh, Christianity, the woman prior to Eva or to Eve, because apparently there was a wild woman before Eve, a woman who refused to be domesticated like Eve and made responsible for picking up the, the apple, from the tree and all the disasters came. Be of course, we always blame the woman, right? Plus the idea of the woman being born from the bone of Adam, a very uh, almost unacceptable uh, conception. Now, why should the woman uh, be born from the bone of Adam? Why not have Adam be born from the bone of woman? But anyway, it appears that in mythology, there is Lilith, the woman prior to Eve, the wild woman. And here we see, we see Eve in, in this fresco by Michelangelo is Adam, Eve. And then apparently here is Lilith. She gives the apple to Eve because she's too submissive. She's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the slave of uh, masculine or male theology. Uh, but uh, Lilith was also uh, a weaver herself. Then in Egyptian mythology, Nath, I don't know if I pronounce well her name, she was also the goddess of weaving. Arachne, Arachne is beautiful because Arachne, Arachne was a, a mortal, a mortal woman. And uh, uh, Athena, the goddess, um, uh, challenged her to a competition who weaves better. And uh, the competition apparently was won by Arachne, the mortal, and then the angry Athena uh, cursed her and transformed her into a spider. And here she is in an engraving by Gustave Doré. You have Dante, uh, you know, going in the, in the, into the underworld. And here is Arachne uh, cursed by Athena, transformed into a spider and she weaves and weaves and weaves because this is what spiders do. But the story is very interesting because, because uh, 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 Arachne actually depicted Zeus as an immoral um, male who was cheating and so on. And uh, Athena, who sprang from the head of Zeus, uh, defended uh, you know, her creator. It's also very interesting that Athena, Athena, uh, is in a way uh, symmetrically situated vis-a-vis -vis Jesus. Jesus didn't have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a biological father. Had a, you know, uh, you know, uh, extraterrestrial father, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> you know, God Himself, and and uh, and uh, uh, and. Uh, Athena didn't have a mother. She was born directly from the head of Zeus. This is very, very interesting. So Athena didn't have a mother. Jesus didn't have a father. I'm talking about a biological father. I'm not an expert in these matters, but uh, they stirred up my, my, my imagination and my curiosity. And Frigg, the goddess of weaving for the Scandinavians. So all goddesses are uh, of weaving are just that goddesses and this one is for the hindu turga also a woman a lady so that's why i said that uh, architecture with its second part of the word texture is a is a fem feminine enterprise ultimately it comes from weaving and since all goddesses were women 
Well, I let you reflect on this. And here we see the, you know, the the Queen Elizabeth of Romania, 1843, 1916. Herself was very fond of. Uh, I don't know if she was weaving herself, but in this uh, picture, it's obvious uh, that uh, she was very interested uh, in what appears to be connected with weaving. But back to Benedetta Tagliabue, sorry about this intermezzo, but it's a fascinating subject, I think, the subject of weaving and architecture. And in a certain way, this is what Benedetta Tagliabue wanted to do with this pavilion for Spain. And I think she did a great job. And uh, I'm not sure that uh, people still understand the implications of this building. This is weaving. This is he, he actually she actually repeated what the, the, the you know primordial uh, man did then around the fire that Godfrey Zemper uh, uh, described. The interior it is as it is, but uh, this fact that she needed uh, uh, needed uh, weaving to be present in the making of the building. Um, shows a disposition towards uh, non-conformism, which is uh, connected with uh, the very beginnings of architecture. Benedetta Taliabue from the office Miraes Taliabue. Now, yes, behind the panels, the mobile panels, uh, the woven panels, there is this uh, steel structure. This might be a problem, I, I confess, I recognize, but Still here, there are layers of meaning that should be addressed. The Spanish pavilion in Shanghai, uh, I think 2008, if, if I'm not mistaken, or 2012, but it might be 2008. It's the art of ba ba basketry, you know, it's, 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 uh, this is a rendering of, uh, of the project before it was built. Now, I, by the way of this, I would like to show you a project that um, an architect from New York, she's now in New York, but and she was actually born in the United States, but uh, she was Egyptian. She is Egyptian. She's still young. Shakira Hamad, and I knew her personally, and we collaborated for about 10 years when she volunteered to help me with a website. She was in Alexandria, and I was in, in Romania. Anyway. I want to show you a project that she did, which is about weaving, weaving studies that she did in Maya. I know that the students here in Bucharest study Maya, but I didn't yet meet a student who would be able to do something like this. You see here weaving as well, literally, it's about weaving. Uh, and the meticulousness of, of, of this work is amazing. You know, because it's very rigorous and at the same time very free and, and very not like and complex. You could say this is not yet architecture. I'm going to show you a project, but the idea to weave in this way, I think, is very courageous, actually heroic, and even at the level of graphics. Because of the complexity of the work, again, this was done with Maya. She had a postgraduate uh, training in Vienna where they worked one semester and a half only in Maya and the other one semester and a half, they created the um, uh, diploma, the thesis. Imagine doing something like this. Again, it's about an imagined possible architecture that is woven. Uh, these are uh, this is uh, the office, an image of the office of, uh, of Benedetta Taliabue in, in Barcelona. 
as here she is with her books. She lives there. It must be very pleasant to work there. She was also Benedetta Taliabue. I don't know if she still is um, uh, uh, a member of the jury of the, that offered the Pritzker Prize for a number of years. Uh, images, other images of her work. We are going to uh, see more in detail some of his works. So here is a dialogue with Benedetta Taliabue. Uh, question, in looking at your design values, who or what has been the biggest influence on your work as an architect? And she said, well, of course, I always say that the biggest influence is my husband, Eric Mirais. He was a person looking everywhere. I think I have the same attitude of being very curious, curious about the works of others, but also curious about what artists do or what other types of professions do and what can be discovered through films. I think this is maybe the type of influence we can Im imagine in our own work more broadly. Uh, here she is with Eric Mirais as a young woman and him uh, still a young man. The Scottish Parliament building in Edinburgh in United Kingdom from 2004, uh, Eric Mirais died, but she continued the work, but they won the competition in, and it's the most, it is the most unusual building. Look at this, who would think that this is a governmental building at the, building, at the highest level of political uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, activity? It is fragmented. Look at these, look at these um, uh, bow windows or alcoves from the inside. They are unimaginable in general, uh, you know, for, a, for any kind of building. But for a governmental building, they would be, you know, almost inconceivable. They were built. And you are going to see pictures also from the inside. Uh, here is a construction worker in the, in the very unusual uh, shape of the window of the parliament building in Edinburgh. And now a view from the inside where the, um, you know, governmental official sits here, maybe with documents and files here, folders and uh, studies them near this unusually shaped uh, window. It's an architecture that in most uh, situations would be inconceivable but they built it again. This shows, you know, that the level of motivation, if it's very high, and if you truly believe in what you are doing, you can do, uh, you know, uh, uh, exceptional things or, or very, very different things. Look at the gathering place, the, the big, uh, uh, you know, uh, room for, uh, you know, the, the most important decisions to be taken at the political level. And I think it is an admirable space. And truly, Benedetta Taliabue, since her husband died, she had to carry on this very complex, demanding project until finalized, and she succeeded. Uh, bravo to her. I mean, it was a... Uh, uh, a uh, formidable effort, and she succeeded. Look at this architecture, a governmental building, a parliament building. It, it was meant to be a building which doesn't crush, doesn't uh, uh, dwarf the people, but you know, with many fragmentations to make it more uh, uh, conducive to people who uh, enter the building to handle uh, all kinds of matters. So it's not an intimidating building, it's rather an inspiring building with levels of, uh, of an organic architectonic culture that uh, are uh, almost uh, uh, impossible to contemplate in the case of such a building. Uh, here you see, uh, again, other images of this, uh, uh, of this building. Mirais Taliabue and from above. 
and here is the prime minister, uh, well, the queen, the you know, the former queen of, of, of England, and uh, I guess the prime minister of Scotland uh, visiting the building. I wonder what what they thought. It was built. And it was built because the, the architects were taking risks, were courageous. They were not afraid to betray the art, artistry. And I think this is something we should learn. And these are all unique, all similar in character and yet unique. Each window, each bow window and each alcove, they're all a little bit different. Very unusual architecture. Now the campus of Fudan School of Management, Shanghai, China, in progress. Uh, I don't think, as far as I know, I, uh, I I didn't see pictures of it being built. A tower also in China in progress. I didn't see pictures of this one either as being built. But this one, a, a social housing block in Madrid, uh, this was built in 2013. Uh, it's not so interesting, perhaps, but it was built. Uh, we move forward and the Diagonal Mar Park in Barcelona from 2003. Uh, here we see ceramic work and I truly think there is high time to bring back ceramics to architecture. In this case, even more so since it's the city of uh, um, Antoni Gaudi, who also employed lots of ceramics in Park Güell and in other works. Um, so it's a, some kind of an homage to him by employing uh, the ceramics in this um, uh, very different park otherwise compared to uh, Antoni Gaudi's uh, Park Güell. Santa Caterina market, it's a market in Barcelona. And here it is during the construction. And uh, uh, here it is the, the project seen from above, the roof of the building and uh, another rendering of the roof of the building. Art is present, color is present, even figuration is present. You know, some approximation of fruits perhaps on the roof and look at the plan. You would say it's mad, it's maddening. Well, so is life sometimes. And then the negotiations with the people who sell fruits and vegetables and uh, coal cuts and whatever. I like the plan. It's 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 alive. It's uh, visceral. It's um, interesting. It's engaging. And you see the building built. Of course, the timid one would ask, "Why does it have to be that this way?" But the one who is not timid would answer, "Why not?" And you will see because the dynamics of negotiation within a market are somehow conducive for that kind of uh, tormented, um, uh, you know, plan. Maybe partially tormented, maybe not so much tormented, but we see it's, it's almost like the cathedral of food. It's not the only one, of course. There are other cathedrals of food. Sorry for the, you know, the question of religiosity of my language. MVRDV also did a market in Rotterdam that could be called, to an extent, the Cathedral of, uh, of uh, Vegetables or the Cathedral of Fruits. Uh, so this is the building that built by uh, Benedetta Taliabue, but maybe the project was initiated by both Eric Miraes and, and her. And some views from the inside. I truly believe architecture is beautiful if it is an adventure. And if it is not an adventure, it could become very dry and, and, and tiring.
Now, you might not agree with this kind of architecture, but you know, you cannot contest its originality. And it was dealing also with an existing building there, as you can see. Eric Miraes was not really a deconstructivist, nor is uh, Benedetta Taliabue, but the fragmentation first Eric Miraes brought to architecture could be somehow approximated as being uh, a deconstructivist. Although I see here more effort towards some kind of a synthesis to bring the fragments together. Gas Natural Office Building in Barcelona, a more commercial um, structure, uh, that is corporate structure. And I'm not uh, particularly impressed by it, but this part of the building impresses me because I think this shows the rebelliousness of the architects. Otherwise the building, you know, a big anti-lever part, uh, all glass and so on, we have seen such things. It is this, this part which intrigues me, I don't know what is happening inside, what kind of functions, but I would say that this is an expression of, of rebelliousness, because I don't believe Eric Miraes and Benedetta Taliabue uh, appreciate a lot co the corporate culture. I don't think so. But it's the irrationality of this object, which through its reflections and its distortions, create some kind of an opposition to uh, the corporate culture and, you know, uh, to capitalism itself, somehow, indirectly. And look at the plan of the building. It was built like this. So who says that clients are, uh, you know, not accepting extravagant architectural gestures are not always correct. There are some that do ex uh, accept and even, uh, even embrace, perhaps. How else to explain, you know, the, the building of, uh, of this part here? For my taste, too much glass, but this was the time and this was the company. Gas is expensive. The gas companies are doing well. So <laughs> let's give them glass. Clichy Montfer Mont Montfermeil Metro Station in France. This was a uh, competition they won, her office. And actually uh, part of this uh, project was uh, uh, given to a uh, Romanian architect who studied in Bucharest, Elena Nedelcu. She became a partner in this firm. And I know she worked on this competition. They won it. This is the plan of what they proposed in Paris. Uh, I don't know the significance of that particular uh, face that uh, was employed uh, in the, in the conceptual conceptualization of the building. But uh, interesting way even of exploring the architecture, the visualizing it. Also references to ethnicity, because this was in an area of Paris where uh, people of other ethnicities uh, lived, and they, they wanted to honor uh, this diversity, ethnic diversity, and I, I, I believe that this was the correct way to do the correct way to act. They want the competition, they are building it. Maybe it's already built. I'm, I prepared this presentation two or three years ago. It's a very big uh, subway station and, and, and they were building another one in Napoli, equally uh, big.
a complex uh, program and a complex uh, undertaking. Again, this is in France, in Paris or the suburbs of Paris. No ornamentation is present, uh, some form of weaving. You cannot have just structure. You also have so, to have some, some ornamentation and maybe uh, an ornament that becomes structure or a structure that becomes ornament. Uh, in the process of uh, building up the project, all kinds of procedures were considered, understood. That's how they work, uh, you know, with a lot of collages and uh, uh, bringing together towards some kind of a synthesis many elements. International Horticulture Exhibition in Xi'an, 2011. I think we need more and more horticulture that is nature, that is plants. And this is uh, what uh, they did or what she did, Benedetta Taliabue. This is a fragile architecture, but it is a positive thing that it is fragile because you are not going to build for horticulture in concrete or I don't know what. You know, if this is about the life of the plants, not the life of the humans who need to glorify themselves beyond all uh, measure. The rector of his Vigo University campus, a different kind of work. This is not for the plants, it's for the leaders of a school. Anyway, um, but here we see again. Um, complexity and even contradiction, uh, if we are to uh, refer to the title of a book by Robert Venturi, although the architecture has nothing to do with Robert Venturi. But we see the, the, the value of ornament and variation in the facade and, and the materiality of the facade, which matters. Extension of Youth Music School. Here is a, an auditorium that bears the name of Miraes, as you can see. I think this is in Germany uh, or the Netherlands. Miraes Saal. Miraes, um, I guess um, it's an auditorium there. It's a music school that was built. Maybe they won the competition together with her husband. I don't know. Lavid Pavilion for Expo Milano 2015. Here it is. It is structure that became ornament. And I think the, the, the dialectics between structure and ornament are very important. So if you can make the ornament become structure and the structure become ornament, you have a chance to create a, a building that is both uh, sound, uh, but also uh, pleasing. Uh, architecturally speaking, aesthetically speaking. Here we see the building by Daniel Lipskind for the same uh, expo. Uh, for China, he built it, a dragon-like uh, building, kind of, with the exception of the top, which is flat. And these were built by Benedetta Taliabue. A view from the interior. Complex structures, of course. 
because our life is complex. We cannot go any longer with the simplicity of, uh, you know what, you know, that those uh, rectangular uh, Cartesian structures, which are, uh, you know, after a while became tiring because uh, they keep re repeating themselves. And do, they do not welcome the labyrinth of life. Naples Underground Central Station, so I, I, I said that they are also building a, a big uh, subway station in Naples, in Napoli. Uh, here is an image talking about cathedrals. Well, uh, this is not the cathedral of, uh, of uh, fruits and vegetables, but the cathedral of, um, you know, uh, high-speed, um, you know, trains or high-speed uh, subways. In Napoli, I don't know if they advanced with this work. Uh, they won the competition, uh, and this is the model for it. And this is a tower in China that was not built, as far as I know. Or not yet. Too much glass for my taste. Another tower in Taiwan, costly as it is, and inspirations in the creation of the tower. Uh, not uh, immediately uh, transparent to the thought why, why, why exactly uh, these things uh, turn into that tower. I'm sure there is an explanation, but I didn't quite understand from that page. This one was at one point in construction, as you can see. But I never saw it um, um, finalized. This is a very interesting museum built in China uh, for a, apparently a famous painter, the Picasso of China. And uh, I don't have the images, last images of the finalized building, but you'll see some structures being built. This is the plan, it's like a, uh, you know, a so-called primitive uh, little village with pavilions and um, it's, you know, quite, uh, quite dramatic. Uh, these uh, constructive elements are actually made of steel plate. So it is clear, Benedetta Talia Bue uh, takes risks. It's, she's creative. She doesn't allow to just repeat works, uh, you know, from a comfortable position. No, she reinvents herself and the work of her office uh, with each new project. And she welcomes materiality and viscerality and complexity. And I think this is a good thing. And of course, weaving. The project, the rendering of the project. It's a more unusual uh, project for a museum because usually museums have white walls inside at least and uh, you know, uh, rather flat surfaces. Here we see something else. Now, I end this presentation about uh, about her work, and in the meantime, she built other works. In the, in the invitation to the to the presentation, the second one, I included an image of a church. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to include it in the presentation. But I will end this uh, presentation on the works of. Uh, Benedetta Taliabue, with this stage design for the Merz Cunningham Ballet Company. And it moves me to see that an architect also teaches, who runs a big office, who has many commissions, also finds time to create stage design. And uh, here is Merz Cunningham, uh, a remarkable uh, uh, choreographer at 90 something, 
Um, his partner was a great uh, avant-garde musician, John Cage, or composer. And uh, he commissioned uh, Benedetta Taliabue to create uh, uh, the, the stage design for this uh, uh, dance. And I don't know if I am now inspired enough and if I have the energy to evoke how much it moves me, the meeting between two brilliant people in the name of art, serving art together, and not just the two of them, but also the people around, the dancers, they applaud. They applaud the musician, the composer, the choreographer, they, they applaud the architect, they applaud in essential, in, in, in essence, art and brilliance. This is the stage design uh, of uh, Benedetta Talia Bue. Uh, and uh, what can I say? It's, it's about a, a celebration of life. It's a celebration of the flowering of creativity, of human creativity. And what else can keep us alive, if not that? And here they are, the dancers. And I love them because there is vitality, there is uh, discipline, there is inspiration, there is nerve, there is verb, there is uh, 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 this dynamism which makes human beings uh, earn their lives because we are talking about that, earning one's life. The architect earned her life by conceiving the stage design. Merce Cunningham earned his life by being a brilliant uh, choreographer and dancer. And these dancers do the same thing. And let's hope they inspire us to be equally inspired and inspiring. Because again and again, what would life be without art? And what would uh, life be without brilliance in art? And without creativity, we cannot achieve this brilliance. Look at them, I think they are beautiful. Thank you.